Hey, so what's up, everybody? Sorry about the uh, minor technical issues. First time using the um, stream on YouTube, so just getting acquainted to it. Um, so you should, so we've got the um, stream is up. People are in the chat are saying it's up. I'm assuming that you can also hear, hear me as well. There's also quite a bit of delay between what I'm actually doing live and what I'm seeing on the, the feed. On my side, there's like about 20 seconds. Um, even though I set everything to have absolutely no uh, no delay, I don't know why there's still some. I don't know where it's coming from. So, <clears throat> okay, so everybody's saying that you guys can hear me and um, you're audible and the craft is visible. Well, that's good. Sweet. So we'll get going. Um, I'll keep an eye on the chat on my side here. Um, if at any point the mic is not loud enough or too loud or whatever you guys can just let me know and uh, I'll uh, I'll tweak it accordingly on my side here um, I don't have like a um, a super concrete or hard timeline that I've established for the stream I don't know if it's going to be like a 20 minute or a 60 minute stream I don't really have any kind of um, I don't have anything planned later on <clears throat> but I did plan a few points that I wanted to discuss um, these are basically things that over the months of playing the game and becoming more proficient at it, um, it's things that I've I've developed on my side in how I build my crafts and uh, how I go to about the design process of how I, I do it, um, and and also like it's 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 a lot of me seeing how other people do their stuff. And some of the common mistakes that I see in some of the less experienced players, uh, I've gotten a lot of people over time, either through the Reddit posts or more recently through the YouTube series, that have asked me to do like tutorial kind of stuff, especially for aircrafts. Rocket seems to be less of a thing where people are like actively looking out help uh, for help. But um, <clears throat> winged vehicles, rocket planes, planes anything that has a wing and flies people in KSP who play KSP seem to really have a much harder time grasping the basic mechanics that you need to in order to produce just like a workable craft or a workable design right <clears throat> my background is actually mechanical engineer like I am a mechanical engineer in real life I've worked in aerospace um, I've worked in aviation um, just outside of Montreal. If you're familiar at all with where Montreal is, I'm I'm from the French-speaking part of Canada, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I've been trying to break the sound barrier for a while now. Yeah, um, I'll keep an eye on the chat. If at any point, like I kind of I don't immediately answer your stuff, it's just give it time or just ask the question again. I might have missed it. Um, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to give like a kind of crash course 101 because I've had a lot of people ask me to do that um, so again like this is this is my engineering background that's brought me to the point where I am now it's me having done a lot of craft building in Kerbal Space Program not just for the YouTube series but also like way before back in 131 and 161 and I played a lot with BD Armory before as well so I wanted to give like a bit of a crash course on the basics that you should know and understand and the first thing that I want to start with is this is like one of the first equations you ever learn in engineering it's I don't know I, I don't remember what the first that I learned was but this is like one of the first and even throughout the entire time of my undergraduate studies <clears throat> this thing comes back again and again and again and again um, and specifically, it's called a moment. <clears throat> I don't know what the origin of that word is. Like, it's not referring to a moment in time. Like, that's it's not what it's about. But I think it has to do with the French influence just because um, engineering officially became something like a, a calling that you you did a profession way back, like several centuries ago. And France was one of the first countries to kind of like officially make it an academic pursuit 
So I think it might have to do with the French background behind the word. But what you there's there's basically there's three major things you need to understand in this equation. A moment is basically kind of like a torque, and we'll get into imagery later on where it'll it'll make it more concrete for you guys. <clears throat> Some of you might already know this kind of stuff. Um, so if you know. You can tune out now for, for for just the next couple of while if if you want to, but I'll I'll make this fast. But honestly, like understanding this one basic principle, like when you really get it, and it's not hard to get, so don't like panic. Understanding this thing, you'll start seeing everywhere, and it'll start impacting your designs, especially for aircraft, in like a rather important or significant way. So M is the variable that's used for moment um, units are the same units you'll see for torque in the metric system it's newton meters typically so newton is the force and m is the uh, variable for meters in imperial system you'd have either inch pounds if you're talking about really small values or foot pounds like typically you talk about an, an, you know the torque a, a, car, a car engine produces it'll be in foot pounds or something like that right f is the force that's applied to whatever the object is and d is the distance and specifically f has to do with being a perpendicular distance to it there's there's um there's some variations to this equation where you'll see a sine theta basically being um the sine theta the theta being the angle between the distance uh, and the, the application of the force, what you're really concerned about is the perpendicular force applied to the distance. Visually, it'll look like something like this. So you would have your pivot here where you've got the letter O, and then the distance from the pivot, and then the perpendicular force. And this is what I mean by per perpendicular. If you think of, you know, think of a door, for example, like imagine this is a door and you're kind of looking down at it, you know, looking towards towards um towards the ground basically and you've got um the pivot at this point here <clears throat> if you if you push directly in this direction directly on the pivot the door is never going to move because you're you're basically pushing on the on the pivot directly right so what would happen in that case is the perpendicular distance from the pivot to the force would actually be, or the angle rather between between the, the the distance and the application of the force would be zero. So if you go back to this equation, imagine you've also got like a like f sine theta. So basically, let's let's bring up Notepad and imagine you've got f is equal to m. So that's the or sorry, m is equal to to f. All right, let's see, distance, we'll do D, capital D, and then F sine, and then we'll say this is like theta, okay? I'm not sure how you, well you guys can see it. Hopefully this is not too, too small. But basically, this angle here would describe if this force was not perpendicular at an angle. What you need to remember from all of this, the only thing you need to remember is the only component on a, a given force applied is the one that's perpendicular. Like if this thing is at an angle like that, the horizontal distance or the horizontal component, so when sine theta is equal to zero, like if T is has a value equal to zero, the way sine works is that sine zero is going to be equal to zero. Right, so your moment will then take on a value of zero. So if you push directly against and you've got no vertical or perpendicular component, you're not going to produce a torque. So the only thing you need to remember is basically this image. Remember, it's always a perpendicular distance. <clears throat> now, why this matters in a plane design is like if you talk about the common mistakes that I've seen in people making planes in KSP, like the number one mistake I think that I've seen is <clears throat> where people place the landing gear. A lot of people will have like, I've seen this again and again and again and again, where people, you know, will start taking off on their plane and they'll go the length of what is a really long runway 
almost hit supersonic and they're still on the ground until finally the plane is able to pitch up when the you know they overshoot the runway and the reason is that they're basically if they're putting you know they're inputting force with the the elevons to, to make the plane pitch up but the because of the position of the, the the main landing gear it's killing the plane's ability to pitch up so here's what you need to understand so coming to that law of moments and right before we do that actually like looking at a few airplane pictures look at where the landing gear the main landing gear so not, not the nose gear right i don't really care about the nose gear the nose gear is just there so that the plane doesn't tip over on its nose it doesn't really carry that much weight the main thing you want to be focused on is the position the placement of the main landing gear <clears throat> I feel like if this is not familiar to you, to, you know, just go ahead, go on Google and like start doing some quick searches. You'll see that the main landing gear are always, always, always situated just aft, meaning just behind the location of the of the main wings. Like you'll see it here. Uh, this is I think it's like an, an, an air, like a military version of the Airbus A330. Uh, this is a, a Boeing 757, and again, you can see the main gear are, are just aft of where the the wings are. You know, this is another 757. There's different different perspective, but you're, again, you're, you're seeing the, the gear is here. And a lot of time, what I'm seeing is that people are are placing the gears like way back here, and that's not going to work. It's going to give you a lot of, of 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 issues. So if if like if you look at and so here's why that's a, that's a problem. If I look at the center of mass of the plane, okay, this is the key to understanding. Remember the law of or the equation of mo of moments, right? Where it's the perpendicular force. Here's what's going on. I'm gonna do something just to kind of give it a visual explanation. Let's go with I don't know. Let's go with this. I'm going to sort of like create vectors for. Yeah, so how many people were planning on having a, a physics lecture on a Friday afternoon, eh? You guys thought you were turning in for a stream, huh? Ha! <laughs> Suckas! Uh, let's go. Too small. And length will do that. Okay. So I just want to kind of create. And we'll put it a nice flashy color, something like that. Uh, maybe I'm trying to see which one between. Oh, let's do that. What else could we do? I'm trying to make it like super visible for you guys. Ah, oh, that's not bad. There we go. We'll do uh, that. Okay, so what this guy is going to represent for us is a force. Okay, so this is going to be our vector. And what we're going to do this guy is we're going to do that. We're going to do shape. We're going to do cone. Um, top is going to be super small. So as you probably can guess, we've got an arrow. <clears throat> is it going to be a recording? It's supposed to be, yeah. So. The way the YouTube stream works is that it should actually let me subsequently um, have this as a recording on the channel. So I've got to create, I created a separate playlist um, and I will, every time I do these, whatever whatever the, the live streams end up being about, um, there will be like a separate list that um, will just be all the live stream series because I think these are I think these are fun they're like they're they're informal and I you know I, it's a great way to kind of like share ideas and I I know I've I've gotten I've taken inspiration from other players in the past so you know it's 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 fun to have that so it'll be up basically to to answer your question so your plane is sitting on the tarmac okay <clears throat> here's your center of mass. And I'm just going to move this out of the uh, aircraft's body so that we can actually see it. And I'm going to try and keep the plane such that it's visible. That's not. Let me know if this is like not 
super visible for you guys and I'll, I'll try and find another way to go about it but that should be I'm just going to place a few of these guys for the uh, illustration purposes I'm gonna need just another one after this guy and there's this guy all right we're going to move this guy out of the screen for now because we don't immediately need it. That's uh, perfectly visible. Thank you, Felix. Okay, <clears throat> so what you need to understand now from this is... So imagine your plane right now is is sitting on the tarmac. Okay, so it's, it's on the ground. What's going on in terms of how moments work is the forces that are currently, okay, if your plane is just sitting on the tarmac, it's parked, it's not moving. What's going on right now is you've got basically two active forces on the plane. The first obviously is going to be the mass of the aircraft pushing down on the runway, right? Like it's sitting there and, and it's, pushing on the runway through the landing gear. The nose gear is carrying some weight. I don't know what the ratio is to the rear and the front gear, but the bulk of the landing gear really is always going to be the rear landing gear, right? Like if you take something like a 747 that has like several, um, several landing gear, like you compare, <clears throat> you know, let's see if we can get like a nice shot that shows the entire plane, but um, I guess we'll use this guy here. It's not the best, but you can see you've got, you've got these ones. This is not what I want to do. You've got like four sets of landing gear at the back. And at the front, all you have is a tiny little nose gear, right? So the bulk of the weight really is always being carried by the main gear at the back. For our purposes here, why that matters and a lot of moments is the weight is pushing down and it's always always going to push through the center of mass because what the center of mass is is every component on the plane weighs something from the tiniest bolt to the biggest you know empennage or whatever everything weighs something if you were to basically compress the weight of every single component as a function also of its location on the aircraft, because obviously the farther out a component is, it'll shift the center of mass, right? Because it's, again, every component through the mass and the, its distance to the center of mass is, com is basically c causing like a, a pitching moment is what you call. So pitching moment being, you know, pitch is when the nose goes up and down, right? <clears throat> so what's happening is that the center of mass is basically it's the sum of the expression of every single component on the aircraft that's creating its weight and pitching moment. And then you express it at the single concentrated point, right? So that's what the center of mass basically is. I don't know if that explanation is clear, but what it's doing is that it's basically pushing down. Why this matters for the position of the gears and the first like really super common mistake and i mean like i've seen this so many times and i always laugh when i see it and like <laughs> i kind of feel bad when people kind of start complaining that they, their plane won't fly um if you look what's what's happening is that what's supporting the weight of the plane is the main landing gear because it's slightly aft and you want it to be slightly aft and emphasis on slightly is that if it's too far back, here's my, you're, when the plane is going to basically pitch, pitch up to roll, like if you're about to take off and you're going to want to pitch up, not what I wanted to do. What's going to happen is your pivot point is going to be your landing gear because that is a hard contact with the ground. Like you cannot not be pressing up against a landing gear when you're on the ground. 
So as the plane starts to pitch up to take off, it's exerting, it's pivoting about the main landing gear. Now, why the distance of the main landing gear to the center of mass matters is the weight is basically like you can see it here illustrated. The weight is creating a pitch down center or pitch down moment because your pivot is here. So if we go back to that drawing, this is basically your landing gear. This is the force of the weight. So a weight is a force. And the force that the weight exerts is the mass times gravity. So that's what the you know your weight you stand on a scale and it's giving you mass but really what it's what it's computing is it's actually dividing the mass by whatever you know 9.81 meters per second squared if you're using metric or 14.2 feet per second squared if you're imperial right so imagine this is your landing gear and then this is the force that the weight is causing on the aircraft because the wheels are slightly behind it's going to create a pitch down because it can it has to push like this is the force of the weight if you look like it'll push down in this direction because the pivot is behind it now if the force or the pitching moment created by this guy is a function of two variables the mass of the aircraft which is pretty much a constant except for the fuel um, as you burn it the weight decreases and the other thing is the distance that of the of where the weight force or the pitching moment is located to the distance of the pivot so what that means is if you take the main landing gear and you shift them way the hell back all of a sudden what you've done is you've greatly increased the distance the perpendicular distance in that equation and because you've greatly increased the distance all of a sudden, the pitch down moment caused by the weight of the aircraft has skyrocketed. It's directly proportional. So if you set the gear at a given distance X behind the center of mass and you pull those landing gears and you put them back four times that distance, the magnitude of the pitch down moment caused by the weight of the aircraft will increase by a factor of four. So I don't know how clear that, that explanation is to you guys, but I don't know how many times I've seen people building planes and their plane basically looks like this. And then they're like, why won't my plane fly? I can't get off the runway. Well, yeah, the reason why is because you've got this massive pitch down moment because your distance from the, the landing gear to the center of mass is so large that that pitch down movement of the weight of the aircraft is just keeping the aircraft on the ground. And what's happening is when you're basically pulling back on the yoke and you're trying to get the aircraft to fly, you know, you're, you're telling the, your, 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 your flying surfaces are like that and it's trying to push down. The other thing by having the landing gear super far aft like this is not only have you increased the distance from the pivot, which is your landing gear, and the center of mass's force, therefore creating a large pitch down moment, you've also really decreased the distance that the elevon has perpendicularly to the landing gear. So now the force that it's exerting is creating a super small pitch up moment. So that's a huge problem. So you're you're you've got this super large pitch down that you're trying to overcome and you're trying to overcome it with a small pitch up and the end result is that this guy will always win. So this is one of the most like basic mistakes and easy to fix mistakes I've seen people do tons and tons and tons of times. So your landing gear should always be just a little aft. You don't want it to be right underneath because if it's underneath now all of a sudden you've basically got zero distance in between the 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 force exerted by the gear and by the weight you basically you, the reason you need to have it slightly aft like like this you know it doesn't have to be a hold out and and this is where you'll have to kind of tweak it as you test it to feed, to see if you've done it right um the reason you don't want it super close is that then you run the risk of especially in ksp when your craft actually loads it'll basically fall on its tail and your plane is just going to be sitting on the tarmac like that because this you've got a 
too small of a distance. So you need a certain amount of distance because you want that way to create a small pitch down moment so that when the plane is actually resting or taxiing, it doesn't have this like super unstable state where it will either be like this or it'll be like that or like this or like that because it's not able to, to compose itself. So that's a really super easy fix to do. So again, you want a short distance from the pivot, from the gear to the center of mass so that you've got this kind of a situation, small pitch down moment, and then like a, a, a much larger distance with the elevons being all the way back. So now what's gonna happen is, it's very easy for the aircraft when you're exerting, uh, you know, when you're pulling back on the yoke and, and your elevons are doing this to create lift, or not lift, but to create that, that downward force. It'll be very easy for the plane to, to rotate about its rear gear. Right now it's rotating about the cockpit because that's, that's the root part. Um, but normally it'll rotate about the landing gear, right? So that's a really super easy thing to fix. <clears throat> um, another another thing that you need to understand when you're doing plane design is um, when I used to work in cabin retrofits uh, at a company, we, we would basically take aircraft like 747, well, not not 47s, but like 737s, um, 310s, 320s, and, and various aircraft companies would pay us to basically like redo the cabins, maybe change the pitch between the different seats and that kind of stuff. And one of the things you always had to do that was always super important in in when you were doing your your, your analysis and, and the modification is you had to maintain the C of G. So the center of gravity had to stay at the exact same spot. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons that airplane designers, and it's been like this for a really long time, the reason they put fuel in the wings, there's actually really like two two really main reasons why fuel is always stored in the wings. One is that it's it's free space. Like you need wings to fly, so that's a given. And you need to have a really light structure. So most of the area in an aircraft wing is basically just open space. Um, and it, it gives you a lot of volume that you can use to store something like a liquid, like fuel. So having fuel in the wings is really good because the space is there. But the other really important thing is the weight. Because the fuel, when, when the plane is flying, so if, you know, if we, we tuck the gears away, now in flight, that pivot that used to be the landing gear on the ground is actually now the wings. So now your center of lift is what's keeping the aircraft aloft. And you can sort of imagine or picture, um, you know, you've got something called the center of lift on an aircraft, and that's basically the aerodynamic equivalent to what the center of mass is. So the wing, depending on its shape and geometry, creates lift. Um, and where the wing is located will affect the location of that lift. If you were to summarize <clears throat> and condense in one single point the sum effect of the lifting of the wings, it would culminate at what's called the center of lift. <clears throat> so when you're actually in flight, you've got something that's really more akin to this. And what happens with the fuel when it's stored in the wings, the weight that is being caused, the, well, the pitch down moment caused by the weight of the fuel is located pretty much at the same place by the center of lift caused by the wings. So what that ends up happening is, I'm just gonna exaggerate it here. Uh, we'll use something that's kind of heavy just to, um, just to kind of visually see how the, uh, that, that, that torque marker uh, behaves. So don't really pay attention to that. Um, never fly on a plane that looks like this. As this, the one thing you don't want to have happen is when you're burning up fuel, you don't want your center of mass to start doing something like this. You do not want that to shift. That's why you put fuel in the wings because as fuel is consumed and the weight diminishes, because you've got the same distance 
from the center of mass of the fuel to the center of lift by the wings, that distance is not really changing over time. And so you're not creating this issue where all of a sudden the center of mass is shifting backwards or shifting forwards depending on where your dry center of mass is. And what the dry center of mass is, and, and you guys are probably familiar with this one, is you know, you've got your wet mass and you've got your dry mass. Your dry mass is, is per the name, like when the fuel is depleted. And all you have in terms of weight is the weight of the aircraft structure itself and whatever cargo it's carrying. So if you look at something like this, if we imagine this is a, you know, the current situation where we've got the center of mass there and you've got the center of lift here. If we take these guys out just to have a bit more visual clarity, um, as the fuel depletes, you don't want to see something like this. This is very bad. Because what's happening is, as the fuel is depleting, your dry center of mass will never change. Because it's, it's comprised of the physical mass from the structure, the passengers, the cargo. You, you're not consuming that stuff during the flight. Like you're, you're, not, you're not supposed to be consuming aircraft structure or passengers during a flight. It's just not a good idea. It's, it's bad for business. Um, but the fuel you do consume, right? So the, the moment, the pitch down moment, because it has to pitch down because that's where gravity is pulling it. The pitching moment caused by the weight of the fuel, you don't want it to shift because it, it, it will diminish in magnitude. So it will, like, you cannot have an aircraft that never has a shifting center of mass. It'll always shift ever so slightly because you can never get it exactly right. That's why airplanes will have what's called um, trim, where on the elevons in the back, you basically have like another set of really small elevons. And, and those are the trim elevons. And they basically, as you're going through flight and you're flying at different speeds, at different altitudes, and the air density is changing depending on the weather, the temperature, um, as you're burning fuel, changing speeds, and that kind of stuff, um, you'll, you'll need to basically fine tune the attitude of the aircraft ever so slightly during flight. That's just, that's totally normal. But what you don't want to have something happen is that your center of mass changes in a really drastic way as you're, you're consuming fuel. What would be really bad is something like this. Um, if the center of mass starts to shift um, like really way too far out in front, now all of a sudden your plane is going to have to start fighting really hard to keep the nose up. And that's bad for two reasons. One, it causes a lot of drag. And the second thing is if you start hitting the maximum Pitch, pitch up moment that this guy can produce and you still need to pitch up during landing for example when you're you know you're you're adjusting on your approach you'll get like a very very difficult aircraft to fly so when you're when you're building your aircraft um, as much as possible apply this principle where you're storing fuel either in the wings or near the center of lift what i did for this guy um, and we'll see the guts of the plane is if you look at the location of the tanks and this is deliberate it's not by accident if you look at the direction of the tanks you can see that they're pretty much you know the the midpoint of the tank is really close to where that center of lift is right because that's what you want and what happens is if you look at how the center, like the, the like fuel is going to affect the um, how this is going to shift, it has some effect, but it really doesn't have that much. I could have done a better job here, but yeah, you get the point, right? Like obviously, some some shifting is is okay, because one of the things also to factor into consideration is again, if you're looking at this equation, is if if the distance shifts, that could be a problem. But the other thing that affects the magnitude of the moment is the magnitude of the force, right? So as you burn fuel, just by virtue of having less mass on board, you're not going to produce the same amount of the pitching moment, right? So that's another really important thing that you need to consider as well is um, you need to have 
the center of mass, really not too, too, too far from the center of lift. And you want your fuel situated in such a place that it's not going to shift that balance after or forwards, because that's going to really change the characteristic, the behavior of the aircraft. You know, one of the, like, if you recall the whole 737 MAX fiasco that caused the two accidents, uh, the story behind that is because, like, the, the, the new hotness in aviation, and it's been like this for a few years, um, for for large companies like Airbus or or Boeing, is it's ridiculously expensive to develop a new aircraft. Like it's stupid expensive. So what they rather do in order to to improve the bankability of the aircraft is they improve on the engine's efficient efficiencies, right? So so by improving on the engine efficiency, you're you're reducing the the operational cost for the airlines. Now, if you look at something like this, where the engines on the 737 would be on most most airliners would be situated under the wing like that, the way you get a more efficient efficient engine is by increasing the mass flow of the air that you can basically pull and squeeze out the back. Um, and and you you have and I, I don't know exactly when this was first introduced, but it's been around for like a few decades. But the concept of what you call high bypass ratios. Um, the high bypass ratio basically means the ratio of the air that's being sucked in by the engine in the compressor and uh, through the uh, through the back to, to actually create the power and then the fan at the front. So we'll do something like this. So <clears throat> imagine this is kind of like you've got the compressor and you've got the combustion section, and then you've got the exit of plane, and then you've got like the fan at the front. Older generations of engines kind of look more like this, right? And they were really, really very loud because they, they produced thrust by having super high velocity exhaust. Um, <coughs> incidentally, that's also why like fighter planes are stupid loud and rockets are stupid loud is that the exhaust is causing <clears throat> a lot of turbulence out the back which is creating a lot of noise but it's it's more efficient to produce thrust by having a large bypass ratio so you'd have a portion of the air that's going to go through the compression or compressor high by you know high high pressure com what is it uh low pressure compression and, and and you have like a series of compressors i forget the names so compressors combustion a part of the air is going to go through that and then the rest is going to bypass that on the sides all around a high bypass ratio engine is that you've got a lot of bypass air to the amount of air that's being used to produce power and the more you can do this the more efficient of an engine you have so what boeing did which is well with what the air engine manufacturers, General Electric and, and Pratt did, is they, they did that for the 737 MAX to give it a more performant engine. But the, the problem is that the, the 37 is so low to the ground because it's, it's like an old design where the engines used to be really very small and compact, that to mitigate against that, they shifted the engines forward and up. And what that did is the thrust produced by the engines because it's situated below the center of mass, like it completely shifted the dynamics of the aircraft. And what ended up happening is, is there was a software issue where with the automation um, on the aircraft where it thought the plane was actually going down when the pilots were actually pulling up and the aircraft was completely confused. And, and a lot of that had to do with just because of the shifted positioning of the engines, which caused just completely different behaviors and all of that has to do with what we were talking about which is moments right so you'd have the weight of the aircraft the moment there the center of lift and then you'd have this you know the thrust from the engines i can't get this guy to go so you've got that <clears throat> And the sum of the forces is going to create the resulting moment that's going to decide whether or not the plane is going to stay level or pitch up or pitch down, right? So anyways, that was the story behind that. So just to quickly, quickly um, recap, landing gear position close to the center of mass. It'll make the plane very easy to rotate 
which is what you want. Fuel should always be situated, again, close to the center of mass. It's not as important to have the fuel in terms of the um, up and down. Like if your fuel center of mass is above or below or right in the middle, that's less of an issue. But what, you're, what you also want to uh, be careful with is the placement of your engines. Um, because it also will produce potentially a pitch a pitching moment, right? Like so if you're right, so you've got the center of lift and you've got the center of mass, <clears throat> or sorry, center of lift, and then you've got the, the, the moment from the center of mass, and then you've got when you're flying, you've got this force pushing the plane out the back, if your engine's at the back. Where this guy can potentially become a bit of a problem is if your center of mass is in a given position and then your thrust vector is either above or below that, again, if it's below, look what's going to happen. I'm just going to get these other guys out of the way. If this guy, if your thrust vector is below the center of mass, look at what you got. You've got a force applied perpendicularly at a given distance, a non-zero distance to the center of mass. So as you play with the thrust and the engine is outputting different values, that's going to make the plane either start pitching up or pitching down. What you want for the thrust as much as possible is you want that vector to be right through the center of mass because then the distance is equal to zero. And if the distance is equal to zero, then the moment produced by the thrust is going to be equal to zero. Can I explain how I make fairing fuselages? Yeah, it's super easy. Um, <clears throat> is there anything else to say about that? Yeah, I see, I actually had a bit of this issue in, um, which one was it? I think it was this guy, maybe this one. I actually had that issue um, slightly on on this guy. No, it wasn't this guy. It was the one before that. Anyways, um, I had like a, a three engine configuration when I first came out with this guy. Um, and what ended up happening is, and I knew this was going to happen, but I, would, I just wasn't sure how much of an issue it was going to be. And it turned out not to be too much of an issue. Um, <clears throat> because I just had the one engine on top and then the two at the bottom, both engines at the bottom were below the center of mass and the engine on top was above. So as you can imagine, that created a net pitch up, pitch up of the aircraft because you had twice the force producing twice the pitch up moment that you did with a single engine producing the pitch down moment of the aircraft, right? So that that was a bit of an issue, but it it, it ended up not being too, too bad. Um, so anyways, so that, that kind of covers it for some of the basics of how you need to design from, from a, like a flight functional point of view. The things you need to consider is that, again, understand the law of moments, understand you know, the sum of the moments acting on the aircraft, and, and you'll understand. Now, here, I've basically gone and done the very thing I told you guys not to do. I've put the gear really far aft of the center of mass. Why this isn't a problem in this case is because this plane is air launched. So it'll never need to rotate off the runway and you know rotate about its landing gear. If it had to do that, this thing would be an absolute royal pain to try and get, get it to take off. <clears throat> Um, what what you can do though, and and you see this on something like the X15 or on something like this here, is I could have put the gear really close to the center of mass, but there's a couple of reasons why I didn't do that. One is because this creates a large downward pitching moment once you're on the ground. It also creates a very stable design, so the plane will not want to do much of anything else other than stay nice and level on the ground with the, the nose gear on the ground and the, the main gear on the ground. And when you're coming in from an unpowered glide and you're never going to have to rotate off the runway to take off ever, 
that's basically something that you want to do, right? So <clears throat> to answer the other question too is how I design with aircraft fuselage. It's it's really very easy. I'll go back to the other one because it's it's a little easier to see. So now this is the way I do it. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be the way that you do it. So I always start by um, this is something I used to do when I played with BD Armory a lot, like a, quite a while ago. I did like I, I built a lot of military-ish aircraft, like jets and stuff. And one of the things I did way back then is I I would create this basically this this ejection mechanism. And you've probably like if you've watched the series, I forget which episodes, but if you've watched the series, you'll have seen me make use of this on a couple of occasions. Um, I don't know why you always have such a hard time grabbing this guy. Uh, it's not gonna be the right one. How do you attach wings? Yeah, we'll get to that. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, okay. All right. So I always start by having <clears throat> the main decoupler and everything else is, is basically attached to this guy. And what this allows me to do is if I ever need to bail out the aircraft, I can very easily punch out by just having this decoupler do its thing and decouple the copy from this of the aircraft and then i just i tuck in a parachute here so this thing will land safely and on on the other aircraft this one i i didn't because i think it's i was just i was paranoid about weight but you can also add like a couple of engines which will make sure that um the aircraft really gets out like the copy gets out of the way right and again if you if you're thinking about the law of moments again um Again, you, it's not a bad idea to design it in such a way that it'll create a pitch down or pitch up moment so that it, it, your capsule, if you're coming in for landing, won't have the tendency to go down when you bail out, but, but up. So you know, think of the pilot bailing out. He would basically be going this way if the, unless the plane is, uh, is inverted, obviously, right? So again, uh, you know, force perpendicular distance in this case would be that. Right. So if you can imagine, they'd be here. That's there's your perpendicular distance, right? So uh, designing a plane with fuselage is it's really easy. Like you have to imagine that this thing is basically kind of like a rocket, right? <clears throat> um, this is is nothing else than just a basic decoupler that I've. I'm using the interstage one, and the reason why I'm using the interstage one in this particular aircraft is that I want that that end to be open so that I can I can put the engine through that. Um, um, so this is basically what I do: is that you basically just design a fuselage and something too that's I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but locking the shape is something I use all the time. Like once you've got the shape that you want it to have is, I always lock it because sometimes you'll add another decoupler or something else to use, you know, this kind of stuff elsewhere. And then because you've got multiple decouplers, this thing will just freak out and it'll do something stupid. So if we basically start from scratch and we wanted to design an aircraft fuselage, I would basically, yeah, I would have my cockpit Um, and I would have my interstage placed correctly. Um, I never, I never use the automatic function. That's just me because I, I've gotten fairly used to digging around with the values here to get the shape that I want. Um, typically, step one will be get the decoupler to be the right size per the cockpit you're installing it on. And then what I like to do is to just grab, not two, but just one, so that you can see what kind of shape you're getting. So obviously this is not what we want. 
And let's say I want my plane to be somewhere around, I don't know, 10 meters will go. So now I'm starting to get close to the shape that I want it to have. So this is pretty bang on. You know, you can adjust it, you can fine tune it, but you know, for the sake of, of being concise here, this would obviously be a really very <laughs> ugly looking aircraft. So you can do that. Right? That would be kind of too long maybe, so let's just bring it down to say seven. So again, you'll have to have the design in your mind ahead of time, but you can kind of see what I'm go I'm doing with the uh, the fuselage here. This doesn't really, in this context, you know, you can start getting kind of weird shapes like that. Um, you could play around too uh, with other stuff. I mean, I would really highly suggest that you f you play around with this. So you can get this kind of a shape. You can get that kind of a shape. Um, this here is the, is this the conic one? This should be the conic one. Uh, where is it? It's always such a pain sometimes. Which one did I grab? I don't know why it's not letting me hold on. Anyways, I think it, I must have grabbed the conic one because it's got this like flat structure, like it's not rounded. So it all depends on what you want to do. But, but basically the idea is you would do that and you would you, you would start by giving it the shape that you want it to have right either bigger or super small and the thing is you you can use these you know this kind of idea to make body panels of all shapes and dimensions and you can like really start to create some really interesting designs um one of the tricks that i i've often used in the past is i'll do something like this and this i've used this is one of the tricks that I used uh, for my uh, for my Atlas rocket for the stage and a half again if you've if you've watched some of the episodes um, you'll have seen it in action this is really driving me nuts I want to grab this guy there we go so let's say I want this guy to be in this in this configuration for whatever reason <clears throat> um, you can lock the shape once you've got it in the shape that you want and then the reason why that's super important is the moment you do that you can disconnect this guy and then you can just basically connect it somewhere else right so you could do that you could grab it again do that now obviously this is this is really not the scale so um, this is just for the purpose of the of the image here I always have a huge huge hard time grabbing the fairings for some reason So obviously this is not to the correct scale, but if you offset them, you can start you can start creating some kind of weird shapes. You could imagine, like if these were smaller, you could imagine, oh, these are the air intakes for something like, say, an F-104, for example, right? So you've got these nice round shapes on the side that slowly blend into the back of the fuselage. And you can imagine, like again, if, if these were in a bit of a better shape, you could start to do something like that, right? You could have something like that. Again, not, not to the correct shape, but I mean, you get the idea where this is how you can start to manipulate this kind of stuff. 
the most the craziest i've ever done by far is going to be my atlas rocket the stage and a half um yeah we'll use the we'll use this guy here all right who we got in the chat i haven't even looked in ranged mango i know you uh, mine i've seen you you're on my twitter uh, felix i'm aware of i got a few got a few faces i know anyways i haven't um i haven't looked at the chat in the in, in the past little while um i don't know where everybody is calling in from um it's it's 5 p.m where i am right now but wherever it is you are if it's late at night um glad you guys could could tune in if it's any day of the any time of the day really it's cool to, to see you guys on the uh, on the on the live stream um uh, I have been planning for a while on, on making this being a thing. Um, I think it could be fun. I mean, if, if at, at, any, at any point you guys have ideas, suggestions, or whatever of live stream ideas, you know, always feel free to reach out to me and do that. It always makes me more than happy. So this is um, one of my proudest builds. Everything you're seeing here, obviously, with the exception of the of the engines. Is, is entirely done out of procedural parts. How many hours I put into this is a lot. <laughs> like, it's a lot. Um, but that <clears throat> 6 a.m. here. 6? Wow. So it's Saturday where you are, no? 6 a.m. I better put on a good show if this guy got up at 6 a.m. for me. Well, I hope you guys are learning some useful stuff. Um, so, yeah. So why I, I came to this guy here is I I 2 p.m. Oh, it's not too bad. 2 p.m. So you're out west. So um, I wanted to show you guys just how kind of, like if you're if you're patient enough, and you become proficient enough with working with procedural parts, you can really really do some pretty crazy and interesting stuff. Um, so this is kind of like up to this point, this has been a bit of a trade secret of mine, you know, my my stage and a half skirt. So you guys are the privileged 18 that will have insight on how I did this thing. That is to say, if you actually care at all, if you want to see this thing fly, you can watch episodes 13. Episode 14 is actually going to release a little later today. Um, before the stream, I was just fine, fine, finalizing the the voiceover. Um, so all of the the editing, the piecing together of the videos, the trimming, um, and the the music, the scoring on it, all of that's been done. So I've got the scripting probably about 75% of the way done. So I just have to finish doing that, uh, fine tune some of fine tune some of the volumes and and then render it and release it so let's say maybe two hours after the the, um, the live stream ends you guys should have episode 14 up and going for you guys so <clears throat> everything you're seeing here is procedural parts again with the exception of the of the engine this is procedural wings this guy is procedural wings all the piping the tankage this is procedural tanks or ro tanks um yeah, thanks. If you guys are liking the series, it's, it's super cool. I appreciate the comments. It's always really, really appreciate it. Atlas rockets that aren't Atlas 3 or 5 are not my cup. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I want to continue to use a stage and a half for some time just because it's so unique and out there of a design I find uh, that I really enjoy it. How I got around to doing all of this is like i obviously like probably like all of you guys i'm a huge aerospace and rocketry nerd right i think everybody that is crazy enough to play ksp in realism overhaul is of that um of um you know that background one of the things i i do a lot of and and how i get inspiration for a lot of my designs really is um I just I study real world designs like if I want to see well what do communications satellites typically look like 
oh, well, they look like this. Like, I'll go on Google and I'll just this constellation, that constellation, this satellite, that satellite, and then I'll just pull it up. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking for the shape of the bus. I'm looking for the positioning of the arrays, what kind of arrays are they're, they're using, how the solar panels are situated, and crude landing in 57? Yeah, that's crazy. You got me beat there in time timeline ways. Yeah, so I'm I, I love to just one is I just I like learning about actual real world designs. I just I really enjoy learning real world designs. I like studying it. I find it super interesting, right? So I've many, 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 many times I've gone on Google and researched this or that design, this design, that design, and just take inspiration for, from it, right? So recently in my in my uh, Let's Play, I've started, uh, I've got some upcoming launches which are <clears throat> uh, not unlike the, not the hexagon satellites, but... Uh, was it Corona? Corona were the smaller ones. There's another one. Anyways, um, where is it? Reconnaissance satellites. Um, I'll look at actual reconnaissance satellites to see what they look like. And, you know, you've got the Corona satellites and you've got the larger Gambit satellites, which use the Agena uh, propulsion system and guided system. And then you'd have all these film return capsules at the front stacked back to back. And so I, I go into actual designs and I just look at picture after picture and try to understand how actual engineers, well, I am an actual engineer, but how engineers who worked on these things solve the problems and why the designs are configured the way that they are. I think it's interesting just to learn period, but then it, it helps you produce some really believable designs in KSP. And to me, um, <clears throat> To me, I don't, I don't ever send something into space that doesn't have at least some degree of believability in the realism of the design or the aesthetic ple pleasantness of the design. Um, you know, I love looking at something like this, like actual technical drawings. And it'll point where all the different stuff is. Um, if I've, this is actually one of mine. This is a picture. I think this is one of mine. A picture I took of when I went to the United States Air Force Museum, which is completely bonkers to go and see. It's so amazing. You've got so many awesome things. Um, this is one of like, not like sort of recently declassified hexagon spy satellites. Um, these launched on shuttle, and you you can see like if if you've played, you know, what those domes are is uh, is these guys. It's the and yeah, let's put this guy here. But you've got that uh, return capsule. That's what these guys are. That's what that's what the inspiration is, right? So what you're seeing here is is these guys. That's what these were. These were the, you literally had rolls of film, used up film, filling up these guys like like miles and miles of films rolled up in these guys. And when they'd get full, they would be jettisoned sent back, re-enter, and recovered. And that's how they got the films back, right? When I did the Atlas, and this is why I came into this folder, um, <clears throat> you know, there's Atlas Centaur, Atlas Able, uh, Atlas Agena, and then I've got like I've got Atlas 2, Atlas 5, Atlas Centaur, and then this is where you'll get in. And like, look at all the pictures that I've got. Like, these are all pictures that I went and researched and found out of old Convair or NASA archives, right? And... I'm looking for pictures like these. Now I'm like, okay, what's going on here? Here's the engine. I know this is the booster or the sustainer engine. You've got a tank here. Here are these rails, right? So these guys you'll recognize, right? That's this guy. These guys were basically the guide rails for when that stage was jettisoned. It wasn't going to crash into the to the half bulkhead or to the engine, right? So these guys were basically guys, and you'll 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 understand exactly what you're looking at here. If you look at this, and then we go back to this, you'll notice like, oh, here's that tank, here's that pipe, this pipe here, that's this guy. 
right? And then you've got this pipe feeding in to the turbo pumps of the sustainer engine. You can't super like you can't see it really well here, but you can sort of see it. Um, this guy here, this guy here, this is where the vernier would be located. If you're looking at this guy, that's what this guy is here is all about, right? This is this guy right here. And I looked at so many pictures to try and basically break down this design and understand how it works. Here's here's the other side. That That's that big external pipe that you see up to this day on the Atlas. Um, well, the trick to designing this without going insane is you got to be insane to begin with. Ha! See, that's that's the trick. I'm not I'm not always a fully functioning person. I guess geniuses are kind of like that. We're eccentric. Um, so yeah, here's that big pipe on the outside, right? Personally, I have a lot of fun doing this kind of stuff because it's so satisfying afterwards when you actually launch it and you see it and it just looks so good. That's why I love making those cinematics like you see it in episode 13 and you'll get a bit of it again in episode 14 um it looks so good afterwards right and like you won't be you won't be building this thing again and again and again because you're going to build it once you're going to refine it it's going to be good and then you're going to store it in your uh <clears throat> what do you call these things again uh sub assemblies right and then you just, every time you've got your satellite, you just bring out whatever rocket you need and you, you just stick it underneath the satellite and you check that your, your DV values are okay. So coming back to the initial discussion of uh, using fairings to either produce an aircraft fuselage or something as bonkers like a stage and a half stage. Um, this is one of the components. Um, this is another one. This is another one. All these are small pieces of fairings. And what I did to do this is I won't use the base because I, I need the inner stage one. Because again, I, the thing is, uh, if you're not familiar with procedural parts is or procedural fairings, like you'll see it here where the payload one, so the one that says payload fairing, you'll see how all the lines close up at the tip and the inner stage one are open. So if you want to produce like an open shape, you need to use the inner stage one, right? So what I basically do for something like this is, especially for this design is I flip it upside down and then I grab the piece that I want and, and depending, you know, I'll grab, uh, there we go. I just want one, just one. So I'll have it here and then I'll give it the shape that I want. So I'll play around with the base and, and resize the base and, you know, uh, let's, let's do something like that. You can do that. And then I'll, I'll constantly be referencing the actual thing. So if we can find an actual picture, like I'm, I'm looking at something like this and I'm looking at how the outer cowls are, are, are shaped and how the inner ones are shaped and and in my mind I'm, I'm piecing this thing together in my mind I'm like okay I'm, I'm gonna need to have this separate shape and then that separate shape and um, there was one that I used uh, this guy here so see this was great that was a great find because now I'm like oh, okay this is going to be one circular shape. These are going to be two half panels. This is going to be another circular shape that's going to be one piece, but with a different texture to kind of recreate that the, that ridging on the exterior. And then these top pieces, this is going to have to be one piece and then another piece here. This is going to have to be another piece to allow this gap here. And I needed to do that because you've got all of this piping on the outside. Like you guys probably aren't kind of nuts like I am. So you don't have any piping on your rockets. But I started doing this like, I think it was on KSP 131 and I wanted to build an Atlas V. And one of the key features on the um, Atlas V is that super huge pipe 
at the back, right? Like you've got this really massive piping on the back and you've got the avionics unit. And it's like, it's a super this you know distinguished feature on the Atlas V. And it's the reason incidentally why the SRBs are asymmetric. Like that's one of the quintessential thing about the Atlas V is that it's an asymmetric rocket and it has to do with that external piping on it. Um, and I started doing that just because I thought it added just that one pipe because I thought it added such a quirky, interesting look and it just made it so much better. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to do it. And it was super basic at first and then it just grew from there. Like the joy of doing that and then putting that kind of external detailing on the rocket just it took off for me like it was a lot of fun to do um, did i make the three no this 3d model here is not mine this is i have no idea where i found it again this was a google search um i just use it for reference for for how the srbs are skewed there's better stuff out there that you can get i honestly this is not even the best that i can get um but see like again I've got all these pictures and I'll just try and cover all the angles and study everything I can get my hands on to, to make sure I understand how this works. Like I'll, I'll go through documents like this as well um, that I find super interesting because you can see a whole bunch of more technical kind of details that you wouldn't otherwise get. Like something like this, like how they do their ride share services. Like they've got the main satellite on top and you've got all the side stuff. Uh, um, <clears throat> So I, I like, look at this, like this is a great idea on how to do something, right? So I took that, we'll come back to this guy in just a little bit, but I wanna show you guys something. Um, this is an older design that I had before I started the Let's Play series, but I still have, I still have the build. I'm just gonna try and find it. It should let me load nevertheless. Um, did this guy, nope, this guy doesn't have it. Which one has it? Well, let's see, maybe this guy's got it. No, that was a CubeSat design I was working on potentially. Um, anyways, I could probably find a picture at some point, but I don't think I have what I'm looking for for some reason. Yeah, I don't have it. Anyways, this is, <clears throat> but again, see, you can see like, look at how bland it looks if all you've got is like a straight tube versus just adding a bit of pipe work. This is like, this is three pieces, you know, one piece, one piece, another piece here, a couple end caps. And I mean, like, this is a very simplified design, but you know, I used, <clears throat> I used a square function on, on the procedural tanks to create that kind of shape. And then you've got the retro rockets in here. And it just, it looks, it looks so much better. Like for me, when I see designs where, and I hope I'm not gonna insult anybody, but, um, I don't have any quads unlocked. Do I have? Can I get this guy? Yeah. Like for me, when I see people designing a rocket and I see like just, and they've got quads sticking out on the back like that, and they've, you know, they've done something to that effect. And I know some of you are probably guilty of this, but when I see something like that, that like it makes my skin crawl. <laughs> like I can't. First of all, you would never see something like that on an actual rocket. So to do it in KSP. And this is this is just me. I'm quirky. I know, but <clears throat> that to me would just I could not live with myself if I launched something that looked like this, right? But again, that's just how I do it. But if I want, if I needed to have quads on a design, I would unless I'm going for like an Apollo capsule kind of thing where he, the quads were like super visible like that. If you're trying to recreate that look, that's that's fine. That's one thing. But I would use something where I'm hiding the quads in something like this because it just now as this looks like it's a structure that's actually holding the quads and it's not just out there looking stupid. Like I'll do something like 
I should be able to find it in some of the recent stats that I launched. Yeah, this guy will give it to me. And I haven't forgotten about the stage and a half. I'll, I'll break it down for you guys. And, and then maybe we can call it quits unless you guys have some questions afterwards. It's taking a bit of a while to load just because um, it's not just loading this highlight, but it's loading the rocket as well. Should be coming along. That's the one thing about playing RP1 and Realism Overhaul and RSS is that the load times are just crazy. They're kind of worse for me just because I put the detailing and it adds a lot of parts to load. So your, you know, your mileage may vary, but. Alright. <clears throat> It'll always load like this. Um, and you, you'll you see that when I, when I break this guy down, why it, it, it does that. Just gonna get these guys out of the way. This is why I'm afraid to do streams of KSP myself. Thing is about as stable and smooth as the leading therapy. Is the is the stream all right? Like, is is the quality like is it stuttering or something like that, or is that what you're talking about, or or did I am I not getting you correctly? So what I wanted to show you guys here is uh, you'll see, I'll get these guys out of the way and you'll kind of see it. And this is, um, that was the upper stage that I, where are they? There we go. It's better than I expected for KSP. No quality is good. I was commenting on the loading times. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> so um, let's just get this guy out of the way. So see, here's like, th this was the design that I, I came up with for, again, if you're watching the series, you'll have seen this guy before. Um, frame rates and quality are fine, but your case is just prone to crash. Yeah, yeah, but although, like, I don't know if there's any mod, the mod builders watching right now, but honestly, like, the work that's been done on 181 is just crazy, man. Like, it's it's been such a refined, like, it's still not perfect, but honestly... Some of the mods that are used, like like Principia, and RP1, and Realism Overhaul, and and Fair Aerospace, like some of the mods that are used are so stupidly complex that it just blows my mind that people will take the time to do this and they just kind of put it out there for free and then like maintain it and update it and it's um, like I love it. It's it's crazy. I love this community. Um, so this was the design I came up with um, the Baker up a stage. The name Baker actually comes from like, you know how the military uses Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta for the letters of the alphabet for clarity, psych over comms? Before it became Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, it used to be something else. And it was Abel, Baker, Charlie, and I forget what the other one was. So so the Thor, Abel, Rocket, that, that upper stage, Abel, that was basically they started with the letter A in that kind of alphabet and that was the first word was the word able so that's where the name of that rocket comes from so i kind of wanted you know just for like historical easter egg in the series i wanted to have something like that so i went with the next one down the list which was b baker so my my atlas baker is basically the take sort of on the yeah there you go abel ba abel baker charlie dog yeah um, so I went with Baker because I didn't want to use Able as well because I wasn't going to create the Able upper stage. I wanted to use the XLR 11s and there's there's two main reasons why I did that. I've not seen, I think once I've seen somebody use the XLR 11s for something other than a plane. So to my knowledge, I am the only one that's done this. I probably am not. But... Um, <clears throat> To my knowledge, I'm 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 the only one that's done it, and there's two main reasons why I decided to do this. Reason number one is, and I don't know how well you guys are going to see. Just to answer your questions, hey, thanks, James. Appreciate it. 
Um, reason number one, and I don't know how, how well you guys can see it, but these guys have ignitions remaining equal to four. And what the overwhelming majority of your early engines will have is until you start getting to the AJ, AJ10 mid, is you will have a limited number of ignitions to one. But this guy has four. And what that allows me to do is I can then very easily do, if I've got enough fuel, depending on the kind of orbit I'm trying to get to, um, I can have on orbit restart capabilities. And that's really huge. Like it's a huge thing. It's a really huge thing. It, it, it makes it for a very flexible design. And the other thing too is if you've watched the series from the start, I didn't start with rockets other than the really basic um, sounding rockets. <clears throat> I started with um, I started with uh, space planes. So these guys, albeit it was the the RM three variant, which is you know it's it's not great, but it's there. And then, but I started with the XLRs and then I moved up to to the elevens, and and then for this guy to the dash thirteen, but. I had a lot of reliability data. And if you look at the data, like it can go up to 99.8% reliability and ignition goes all the way up to 99%. Like for early engines, even for late engines, that's about as good as you're ever going to get, except for maybe like way down the road where you might hit like 99.5 kind of crazy stuff right so having restart capabilities and like really high reliability off the bat because i had flown these guys so much on my x planes by the time i started building this guy and that i had uh, you know the booster and and sustainer engines powerful enough to have a worthwhile uh atlas rocket that could push this guy up um, these, that kind of really give me a lot of flexibility with this stage. The biggest issue though is the biggest issue there. Yeah. If you've got the RL10, then you're kind of further down the tech tree than I have because RL10s like Hydrolox, that's like way further down the road. That's typically late sixties, early seventies, um, so the one problem with this design, the one limitation is that these guys don't gimbal. So this is why I had to come up with this kind of design where I'm using RCS and the fuel inside here, which currently is, is high test peroxide, which is not which is not the best fuel to use. Like it, it won't give you the best specific gimbal. So it's just I haven't yet unlocked uh, hydrazine, which is what I want to get next because it's it's much better. Like you've got 187 seconds of specific impulse versus 121 56 seconds on something like that is is a huge increase in performance like it'll give you a lot more bang for buck um, you know, if we do the math 57 over 121 it's a 46 percent increase right so <clears throat> so anyways um <clears throat> I had to use something like this because that's basically what's going to steer the rocket, right? This this guy is locked in pitch and yaw. This guy is locked in pitch and yaw and roll, and then this guy is strictly for all its purposes. So it is it is strictly where is it? It's strictly for and aft. And again, if you're not for your RCS, if you're not using advanced tweakables you really should be using advanced tweakables it really like every time every time i use rcs i always go through this step where i'm like i know this guy is gonna just be doing yaw and pitch these guys are gonna do yaw pitch and roll and it keeps ksp from using an overly aggressive set or quantity of RCS. It if you do that, um, <clears throat> if you do it that way, you will have a much more fine-tuned design and behavior on your rocket. And again, coming back to uh, 
um, the, the moments that we were talking about at the very start of the stream is, again, here's your center of mass, which is that's where the rocket is basically going to pivot about once it's one, it's in space and, and, and flying. You want those RCS pods really far down because as they're firing left and right for pitch or this way for yaw, that distance, that perpendicular distance is really nice and large. So with a very small amount of force, you can create a significantly impressive moment, which will pitch or yaw the rocket. Um, roll gets a bit more complicated because you can't obviously have these guys be super far out because that's just not going to work from a design perspective, right? Uh, so you, so that's why I've got both this set and this set doing the roll. And you have to understand also that this guy, when it's firing for roll, will fire in tandem with this guy. Because if you just had, in case people will automatically do this, but if you just had <clears throat> um, this one guy, yeah, you'd get a roll because you're center massive here. So you have like that distance that from the force to the center of rotation to the pivot point. But because you don't have a counteracting force on the other side, it would also create a net positive displacement this way. So this guy and this guy will fire in tandem. And what's going to happen is this guy is going to cancel the side to side motion that this guy is going to create and vice versa. And together they'll work in tandem to create the role. Um, no, the mic is not muted. I guess maybe the stream lagged or something. Um, yeah. So anyways, so uh, you can see how uh, to, to get this shape is this is something that I've been doing a lot of. of. This is kind of new that I started using procedural wings like this. It started maybe a couple of months ago before I actually started doing the, the series um, on some of the on my other install uh, where I that I quit before, which was one in one eight one, but bef that I quit before. Um, doing a fresh install with the updated mods for the series. Um, I had started doing a lot of this where I'm <clears throat> I'm using procedural wings to kind of create these structural blocks. And it just, it you can start doing some, in my mind, you can start doing some really aesthetically pleasing things, right? And another way to kind of look, that you, you're going to see this in episode uh, 14. Shameless Plug is releasing later today is I st this is something I did like I wanted to I like staging I don't know about you guys but I like it when pieces fall off a rocket intentionally uh, you know, <laughs> keyword being intentionally there it, I like staging it it's visually pleasing it's fun it's fun to build it's fun to see your rocket in action we've got all these pieces kind of doing their thing <clears throat> and especially especially now for this for for the series i try to be really careful when i design stuff to make it aesthetically pleasing but also cinematically yeah cinematic cinematically anyways that word pleasing um and so i find that that having pieces stage helps <clears throat> you also like it when they fall off unintentionally yeah i mean it there's an entertainment purpose or value there as well right so i i added these guys here and these the the thought behind that was that these would be sort of like these this protective cover for the camera pod until the point where it was in orbit and jettisoned um and see so here's here again he, look at this guy here that's a procedural wing right and instead of just having these cameras kind of stick out like a sore thumb like they look like they don't belong and all of a sudden you've got this piece and, and maybe you guys all actually like the shape that i gave it maybe this to you guys is ugly but um, to each his own and i try to be super careful with clipping as well like i don't like parts to clip in such a way that it creates um an unrealistic 
construction. Like I couldn't get this part that not clip into th to this cowling here to the to the fairing base. But you you can imagine like it's not giving me any kind of unreal advantage. And what I mean by that is, I you know I I seen some of these stock peasants do stuff like um, I'm just kidding when I say that. But they'll do something like I've seen people do this where they do something like that and they're kind of like running out of space and they kind of they, they clip it right. So now you've got, in effect, two tanks for the price of one because they're clipping and the game will just allow you to do that. I never do that when I do my designs. Like I always deliberately force myself to respect that just because it forces you to then create more thought out design more interesting design and it forces you to use pieces and to think outside of the box and then your designs start to get really interesting like design is a process that, that you can mature over time there's an art behind it right um so see like the way i i, I position this the return capsule in the middle like that in between uh, that was inspired by by this guy right that's that hexagon satellite you've got the cameras here and the film would basically roll up to these guys but where they were situated uh, we'll use this guy where it was situated in the design like that is the cameras are back here you've got all the propulsion system in in the back i'm not sure what's going up at the front there's other stuff there but this thing was huge like this thing would fill the shuttle bay like it was huge look at the people like that's that's a guy there right um, but look at where at where the return capsules are are located, like just in the middle, kind of like that. And they're not, you know, they're not longitudinally in this design. At least they're not longitudinally uh, situated. And unlike this guy on Corona, where it's at the very tip, because it just had the one, and there was another one recessed behind that. But again, like looking at reworld designs will kind of shape the way you think and put your stuff together and then forcing yourself to respect basic stuff like um, not clipping parts together will force you to have to limit designs and I have to figure out also like if you'll see you can kind of I guess you can kind of see it well this way which background gives you the best uh, I guess I guess this guy what about this guy uh, anyways I guess this is kind of visible. Um, but my fairing size has been tooled, right? I've got, for my Atlas Baker, I have two tooled sizes um, that I basically use repeatedly. One of the reasons I do that is it, it does reduce tooling costs for fairings, although <clears throat> it's not the most expensive thing to tool. Um, but the other thing is that it forces you to have to build a design that's going to fit inside. And this is a real world design issue. Like when they built Hubble, the reason why it has a, I think it was 5, five point or 3.2 meter or 2 point, was it 2.2? And it's like, let's, I, I forget, but let's say just 3.2 just for the sake of it. I think, yeah, it's got to be 3. The reason why Hubble doesn't have a bigger mirror than a 3 meter mirror is because that's how big they could make it and still get it to fit inside the shuttle bay. Like, if they were size constraint. If they could have gone bigger, they would have done that. That's why they did with Webb that huge, massively complicated and dangerous origami where it's it's all folded inside, you know, about itself um, to fit inside the area of, area of five fairing. But, like, having limited space is a real-world design challenge for when you're making a satellite right so like you'll see it it fits super snug but it fits and the reason why it fits is because i designed it to fit right and it just becomes much more interesting when you've got these kind of challenges these checks and balance that that'll affect you and how you do your thing because that's how there's a reason why satellites look the way they do right uh so anyways so <clears throat> to get back to the question that I semi kind of launched upon an hour ago uh, using fairings for for uh, so I'll just stick out the way much realistically. 
I think clipping is fine if it is for adding to the rocket aesthetically or it makes sense practically. Yeah, I agree. Like some parts just stick out way too much realistically. Uh, maybe, I guess. I mean, it, it kind of depends on, on what you're talking about. But again, there's going to be design approaches for, for everyone. But um, So I'm just going to raise this guy a bit. So that I can bring the skirt down. The key to understanding how this guy works is I began by it's this guy right here. This is like the 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 secret weapon, if you will, kind of of on how, what you have to do to get something like a stage and a half. Um, yeah, hey, Carnassa. Good to see you, man. Um, <clears throat> this is basically the trick to getting this stage and a half to work. And the reason why is... Um, where is it? Um, interstage. I like to clip back the RCS quad slightly so the only thruster nozzle will stick out. Yeah, this still makes sense. Realistically, it just makes them more. Yeah, it's true. I mean, again, that's that's one design approach that you can use, right? So, <clears throat> what I would do is I would do that, this, and then I'll move that. And all I need for that one is I need this guy to basically be of a specific size so that it makes sense with respect to the rest of the balloon tank's diameter. Um, this was not a concern. What I need, and this is the trick, is you need it's the height. So I grab the. So we'll say that. Um, uh, we'll say the pipe is starboard, and then the port side will be this side. So port is always going to be like on a plane. Um, let's just go plane. No, whoops. Plane port and. Starboard lights. So on a plane, um, <clears throat> port is always red, and green is always is starboard. So like if if the plane is flying in this direction, up on the screen, left is port red, and green is starboard. And that's always always that like that's from way back in in the boating scene where you had green starboard is to the right and port is, is red to the left right so we'll say that starboard is as again we'll keep that you know we're looking right here and that starboard that's going to be port i started with the starboard side booster engine that was the very first thing that i installed and what i did is you might figure out a different way to do it is i attach it to that node the interstage fairing has this awesome function where that node, this guy here, has the ability to decouple. And that's the secret behind the stage and a half is when you when it comes the time to decouple it, this guy is going to go and what it's decoupling is that top node. And all of the rest of this engine, of this the, the st skirt, is built off of that engine. So what I did is, I'm just going to center it so that it's a bit more easy to follow. What I did is, I basically did that. I had the one engine on starboard that was attached to that node, to the decoupling node on the top that I, I set to be at the right height, right? So I'm at two and a half meters. <clears throat> and then using uh, a series of octo you know, oct what is it? Uh, cubic family struts, yeah. Octagonal struts or whatever the hell they're called. Um, using a series of these guys, I attached piece by piece the rest of the skirt. Because you'll see it when I grab when I grab this guy. See, the whole thing moves. 
because as far as this sub assembly in the rocket is concerned this is the root part and everything else is built off of that root part so if you look at the inside you've got a bunch of the, like this is a, fra a fairing um, here's another fairing you've got two halves these two halves are identical and again all of them have their shape locked because I don't want these guys to get bent out of shape and if we start kind of like um, pulling this guy apart you kind of start to see how it's been pieced together right all of these smaller pieces on top are like this to create the gaps for uh, the piping here this was the if I recall correctly this was for the locks that went into I th was it mixed inside of here because the atlas had the kerosene at the bottom here and then you have the locks here and that's why this guy is white because it's, it, it duplicates the frost that would form um, because the they did not have insulation on the balloon tank so you would get like a good amount of frost on the on that's why incidentally they also invented um what is it wd-40 to protect the stainless steel and to help to help kind of mitigate against frost form forming on the outside because this thing would have formed you know super like balloon tanks it's steel so it conducts heat really well and it's like stupid thin so you had really good heat conduction and it would cause a lot of headaches and problems to have a lot of like these thick blocks of ice forming on on the side of the rocket so they use that because it's an oily substance to help mitigate against condensation and and subsequently sort of solidification of it that would form ice right your designs always boggle my mind. Good to watch you do this and explain it. Yeah, man, it's cool. I uh, I enjoy explaining it. Hopefully, this is comprehensible and it'll help you guys do better designs. I don't know. I I, I sound I sound kind of cocky at the moment <laughs> saying something like that. Um, but yeah, so I had the top part was a pain to do because all of these different pieces had to basically create a circular profile but that would create the gaps necessary so that the tooling wouldn't clip right so like on the one side you'll see it it has like like they're all out of shape now but you'll see like it just it had that one opening here and then i needed to have that extra opening here like that to create the gap needed for something like this I actually still do from time to time have some issues with the staging like it's it tends to be a little hit and miss sometimes it'll do like a really clean step and other times it'll you'll get like one piece of the fairing start mating with another piece of the piping for some reason and it kind of just is annoying that it does that sometimes um, I still kind of have to slightly fine tweak it but um procedural parts do tend to be a little finicky at at times which is so there's a certain amount of limitations but but honestly i've never really run into some serious issues doing that kind of stuff a time lapse yeah i mean I'll, i've got pictures for you guys that i'll be able to show you and, and you'll kind of get a time lapse of it um and then you've got this other half here this is also um this is a fairing as well like this flat piece like that that kind of cr creates that that the heat shield at the bottom and that closes it up um this is a fairing you can do some really weird shapes like if you know how to work the 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 the, the uh the bases you can do some really weird and and like kind of crazy designs i'll see if i can maybe really quickly do something um, so what I'll do is, uh, so we'll do that. We'll get it to 500, and we'll keep that shape. <clears throat> like learn, learn to dig around with this kind of stuff too, and just play around with the parts, and just 
move the sliders all over the place to see what kind of stuff it'll do. Um, like using, so right now I've got start and end uh, at zero. And it, I forget which one, is it this guy? Yeah, so we'll close this guy. Oh, so we've got a gap of about a meter. And see, look at the shape. It'll do this when, um, which is it? Yeah, so see, if the end value is greater than the height value, it'll start to want to do this, like to go back towards the center of, of, of itself. Because if you match them, see, it opens up completely. And if you increase the height, see, it'll it'll do these kinds of weird things. And you can basically, like, look at the weird shapes you can do, man. Like, you want to have a flying saucer? Well, <laughs> there's your saucer, right? So you, that's why I love procedural fairings. And that's why I, I, I use them on... <clears throat> uh, on, on the planes a lot is because if you know how to play around with them and depending if you're using on the the, the conic one or the the ogive one um, you can really create some kind of freaky shots and that's basically how I created this guy here was to do that and you can start to see like all the the the, the, the strut components that I use because see if, if if I click on this guy those two fairing pieces highlight because the thing about the, the fairings is that you cannot radially attach attach them with, but you, you can do that with engines. Like this is how you would normally radi radially attach them, right? Fairings will not let you do that. They need a hard attach point, right? So if I grab a piece, you'll see that none of these pieces have that because I use the, these guys will radially attach right so you can do that and then that gives you a pair of node attach points that you can then use I've got two points on that one that I can now use to attach fairing pieces so if I highlight this guy you'll see that those that one is basically upholding those two pieces. This guy is upholding all of that. This guy is upholding these two pieces. And so it's like it's it, it was a piece by piece construction. Um, fast parts for the Atlas based on skirt. And yeah, no, 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 no. That's the thing. Like I was really, I was, this is all procedural parts. Um, and it turned out really great. Like it, it was a lot of work. Procedural tanks, too, is something that I've used extensively to create this kind of detailing. This basically mimics the... Um, where is it? Atlas Agena. Where do I want this guy? That basically mimics this pipe. Right? And those, those other ones mimic the structural components that kind of held it in place. And that's what you're seeing here and even just adding something like that made a huge difference and see i'm even using this part to uphold these this one little panel so i'll show you i've got i've got a bit of a piece by piece construction also that i um let's see I should be where did i do this Is it this guy yeah here it is So this was the construction process. Um, why? What is it? It's not following the order. Um, there we go. Okay. So you can start seeing like, I'll just kind of go through these and you can start, you can kind of, you'll get the logic and the sense behind it on how I was piecing these bit by bit. And what I was basically doing is I'm using procedural bases to give the shape that I want by 
and this is why I, I never use the auto shape because you could never do that. Um, but I'm basically I'm I'm playing around with all of these values, including the number of fairy nodes. Like I actually went into the <clears throat> into the config files for some of these, uh, like the newer ones, like this guy here. Because the, I needed a smaller piece like this guy here. This was created with a quarter. Uh, like, see, you can you, you can tell what I mean by a quarter, and like this is a half, right? Like, you can clearly see that two of these will make a full circle. These are halves. This is a quarter. You can see like you've got a half of a half, right? This guy and that guy. So that's a half or a quarter. That's a half. So that's how I'm I'm creating part of how I'm creating all these pieces is I'm using the fairing node quantity to also create sections. I've got the outer shape that I want, so I'm I'm using these values here to create the shape that I want. And then if I need a half or a quarter, I'm using this guy. And for some of these pieces like this guy here, which is really kind of very small, this is actually a 12th or a 16th so I went into the config files and I found where the um, this value for the fairing nodes was was established um, hey and I my word about time you joined the stream man it's like two hours in mate where you've been yeah I'm going over the ha the stage and a half this guy thinks he owns the world no I like nine nine he's a he's a good guy he's a good guy um, so I'm playing with a fair, fairing nodes count and I went into the config files because I tried using um, eight and it was still like this this guy here is an eighth so you can see it it's basically well it, it, was it an eighth yeah it's uh, it might be a sixth actually because um, it's not quite this is a quarter and it's not quite it's not quite half or is it anyways I it, this might be an eighth but I needed something even smaller still so I went into the config files and this really wasn't hard to do but I increased the number to 16 by default it's capped at 8 which is fine because most people do not use fairings the way that I do right um, so by going to the to, to the config files for the all the, all the different interstages and also for the the actual payload adapters for all the new ones, um, I updated the value to go all the way to sixteen, and, and that allowed me just for this purpose and maybe for something else down the road eventually I suppose um, it allows me it allowed me to create this smaller piece that basically is tucked in in between this pipe here and then the huge external pipe there that's where this guy would basically squeeze and allow for some margins to, to, to prevent it from clipping into the skirt um, these guys here are all uh, procedural wings and they basically hide the retro rockets and these are basically in real life on the actual atlas um, you can see these guys. Um, this guy here is good. See, these were basically. This is how it actually worked as well. Is it? Is, is that? Uh, these were basically. They had the retro rockets inside of this. And I could be wrong on this point here, but I think these were also mechanical clips for the skirt. Like I have to double check that I'm not 100% sure, but I think this was basically um, the the mechanical clips on the, what held the skirt in place, right? So again, going in and, and checking actual designs and and just studying the hell out of them, and then you can produce some nice stuff, and then that's what these guys are basically about. So if we go back to the pictures from. I don't need this guy anymore. I don't need this guy anymore. This, you can start to see how I started to piece this guy together, right? So I'm using all the the inner stage uh, adapters, giving the pieces the shape that they need, 
And then once I had the, the shape that I wanted, I would then lock it. So then I could take it, I could remove it, I could duplicate it, and then I can position it wherever the heck I need it to be. And irrespective of the value that you give this guy, because its shape is locked, it'll always keep that shape. And then you can just piece by piece start building this guy up. You're kind of looking down here, right? So this view is if I was to go inside and I'm looking down like that, you, you can kind of, you can see where that view is coming from, right? I added these retro rockets as well just to, um, to help fight it off the Atlas just because again, sometimes it, it doesn't always clip. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it, it doesn't. So it's it's kind of annoying. But <clears throat> but yeah. Um, so these guys are basically there to just kind of like kick it off the stage. And I've also I've also got the um, that node on this guy is set to the full one hundred percent. Normally, if I'm deploying a satellite like the ones that I'd use, this guy doesn't have any satellite. That was just like a, a, a test article. But I would use maybe 15% strength to deploy a satellite because then it gives you that kind of nice slow kick off the stage when you release a satellite, which makes it realistic, it makes it cinematic, and it doesn't kind of screw up your orbit because you've just added a huge amount of energy in your satellite when you when you when you release it, right? Um, but for this guy here, I have it at 100%. And obviously, because I need to have my stage at the bottom, I needed to have the node at the bottom, I flipped it around upside down so that it would be in this position. And then it allows me to, it allows me again, like I said earlier, to grab that engine and then start building everything off off of that right obviously not like not like this but but you know you get the idea right so you've got so see i'm kind of just like playing with the components here see this is like you can see the 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 strut here and we're kind of we're looking starboard in how long is the stream going to last? Honestly, I don't really have a stop time. Um, I, this was this was kind of the last thing I wanted to cover, um, unless you guys have have some questions that you'd like me to answer. But um, I think two hours is probably going to about be good enough. Um, I wonder if the fact that the half stage is connected technically on the one side, the high force percent is actually what caused the skirt to want to violently torque when separated. Um, it no because um, I know that it's not the case because I, I did do some testing where I had the rocket just sitting several meters up off the pad and I would just jettison the skirt and it really does jettison perfectly clean like it, it doesn't it really pushes about the center mass of the skirt and not about the connecting node. That's kind of how KSP breaks it down. So if if when you take, even though this is this guy is attached to that one node, that's that's. And if I increase it to, to reconnect it, I don't know why it disappears when it does this. Anyways. Um, <clears throat> It really like once you offset it, it's not it's not saying oh my my connection point is here therefore when I applied the force it's here because you've offset that it'll still the center of mass of this thing is more or less right down the middle line so when it applies a force it'll apply it where it is located. And it'll push, and then depending on if it's pushing on the center of mass or offset the center of mass is what's going to give it that, that, that torque that you're talking about. 
Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, so here's that strut that um, I'm. So you can see, like I've got on the one side, I'm using the one note for this piece, and then on the other side, I'm using that other note for the other piece, and then I'm basically. I've rotated it into place, and you can see you've got the bottom part here. You've got the two side skirts covering the engine. You've got that other half on the other side. And I'm basically slowly building up. And I'm using these guys, which are connected to the engines and to other struts, using uh, their ability to radially attach and not strictly node attach like the fairings. And that's basically how I'm... I'm piece by piece putting this guy together and I'm using the you can see it here where I'm I'm yet I'm not using like the stepped version I'm using like the free move because I need to be able to fine tune it very very you know accurately and and not have the fixed increment steps when it's it's in the other um, other uh, state of being So now you're starting to see the shape that you would normally see. Um, where's that other picture? Right. You can tell you've got, see, you'll, you'll recognize where I'm using the two side fairings here, there, right? That's these guys. And you can see how it's got a bit like of a flat look because it kind of has that in real life as well. Like you can see it, it's, it's not really increasing. It's not tapering towards the top. These guys are, but this centerpiece not, right? So, and you can see you've got the gap there. So I knew this was going to have to be like this guy, one or two halves. What's the green graph icon on your mod toolbar? Sorry if you already the green graph icon. The green graph icon. I have no idea what you're talking about. Sorry. Oh, this guy. Yeah, this is a mem graph. That is for a an improved memory management um, the garbage collection that used to be such a huge problem on previous versions of ksp um, i forget who who the person behind this was but this mod would basically help mitigate and it would be like it would better utilize the ram on your computer to mitigate against the garbage collection issues that ksp had and it would make like a huge difference um i've got I've got 32 gigs of RAMs on my rig right now. <clears throat> and like before the massive updates that they did for 181, like uh, Realism Overhaul and RP1, like they were really seriously updated. Um, my computer, just KSP, because I set it to use the most amount of RAM that it needed through, through th this mod here, Memgraph, um, it would use like bloody 24 gigs of RAM just like just ksp and then windows would use like another i don't know like four or five and i'd be running at 28 gigs out of the 32 available that i had on my rig right but it made a huge difference but now there's been such an, a, a huge improvement with um, the 181 version that this is n much less needed but i still keep it on because it still kind of helps a bit so we've got maybe just a couple more pictures that i want to show you guys in the build and i i've got the the outside tooling or not tooling but piping um, again these are radially attached on some of the internal trusses and stuff like if you look at is it this guy yeah see <clears throat> this guy here is responsible for holding all of this so for something like this which is like a procedural wing I would basically just I would come here positioning it and then I'd move it into the place that I need it to be right and then I would I would give it the shape 
that I wanted it to have or whatever, right? So that was basically how I went through that. And you can kind of see me here doing fit checks, positioning everything slightly, you know, again, um, not having it locked so that it's hard step increments, <clears throat> but it's it's completely free floating. And then just piece by piece, I'm moving it in. I'm, I'm checking the gap between the components. One thing that I did as well, as you can see a piece here that's kind of free floating. Um, yeah, see here, you've got a good idea of how I was, like this was kind of early on, but you can see at the bottom here, I've got all these other decouplers because what I basically did is I kept all the decouplers from all the different shapes around so that if I put the piece in, I, I put it into place and it's like, oh, it's not quite tall enough. It's a little too short or whatever. I could then just basically put it back onto its fairing, unlock it, readjust it, lock it again, and then put it back into the, the main assembly, right? So you can kind of see them there as well and see your see these these pieces here that's going to become that other half ring on on both sides which would was going to become eventually uh, become um, these guys here right so see now I'm it's starting to get towards the end where you've got these smaller pieces that are basically slowly being put into place right And then I'm just kind of like fine tuning it, tweaking it, and, and see I'm I'm checking, I'm checking for stuff like this. So see, like I knew this guy was a little too tall because of where the piping was, and it was clipping inside, and, and I, I feared that would might just be an issue. And then nearing the end, you can see it's it's starting to look into uh, at, at what it it currently looks at or look like now. So see, this is what I mean. Like I I and I document it. So like I've got. Like you can see the different values, right? That I've I've given all the various um, bases, which which give me the shapes that I needed all the, at the various spots. So see, the, these are not nice, clean, round numbers like three or thirty-one five. It's you know this is an odd number because I needed to get that value to get that specific shape, right? What's the piping? Procedural tanks? Yeah, it's a mix. The piping is a mix of procedural tanks and RO tanks. I I use a mix because there's there's pros and cons to both when you're doing this kind of detailing. Getting a pipe that's this small, like the diameter is, is 75 millimeters. You cannot go that small with RO tanks. It just it won't let you do it. I I wasn't comfortable tweaking that in the configs because I, I, that was a little scarier to me than um, having, you know, changed the number of nodes on the fairings from eight to sixteen. That was fairly easy to do and it was a fairly safe thing to do. Um, but I wasn't comfortable going into RO tanks and and doing that because there's there's a lot more. But um, this is procedural for the simple reason that this is as you can see like it's it's a root part to a lot of other parts right yeah <clears throat> well that's the thing right um i don't think a lot of people bother to do piping but i'm, I'm hoping to start a trend here just because i'm telling you like once you start doing this kind of stuff your rockets just start looking like rockets right but this guy here, see, this is modular tank, so that's an RO tank because this guy here is 0.2 diameters, right? So RO tanks will go down to that size. And someone was telling me that RO tanks is more optimized in procedural tanks. So when you're starting to get into detailing like this, like it's it 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 will it'll run a little slower because there's, you've, it's got to work more parts when when in flight and that kind of stuff right so that's kind of like the downside in in having to do that it looks really nice and smooth on the episodes in the series because for the sake of cinematic entertainment 
I increase the speed in post production so that the clips flow naturally because it's really unpleasant when it's very stuttery. Not that my rig ever gets very stuttery, but it's not running as smooth in game as it is on the on the series because I want it to to look good and to be you know uh, entertaining on the series so like it, it wouldn't be otherwise. But um, so yeah, um, it's a mix of RO tanks and it's a mix of procedural tanks just because I wanted whenever I could to use, see this is an RO tank, that's RO tank. Um, you can't get a cone shape with RO tank so I had to use procedural tanks for that. But this guy you can get small enough so that's an RO tank. This guy here is procedural tank because I, I, I wanted to get that shape here where it's kind of like a rounded um, you know, like a filleted cylinder that's an RO tank as well this guy is a procedural tank this is procedural as well uh, again this is procedural just because of the size of the diameter you can't go that small with RO tanks and then this is this is also procedural tank because you can't get a triangular shape like they added this I think it was for 161 or for 181 and I'm so happy that they did that where you can create like a polygon shape and then that, that that just opens up a lot of possibilities as well, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, like 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 anything. Start with doing minimalistic design kind of stuff like this. I went crazy here because I I just I wanted it to look great, and I know that I'll be using my atlas for quite some time. Like now, I've got um, I've got the uh, NA5 variant unlocked so 1960s rocketry and that's just given me a lot more capabilities on this rocket now it's it's starting to get up there but I know that this is going to evolve into a further stretch tank version Atlas Agena, Atlas Centaur it's going to go into Atlas 2 right um, and because again, this that's why I wasn't bothered in putting in this kind of crazy level of designing and detailing because you're going to be seeing a lot of flights of this guy, right? So, anyways, that's about it. Um, we've we're at what is quarter past two hours on the stream now. Um, so that was kind of what I wanted to show you guys this time around for, for episode one of the stream. Um, YouTube is supposed to give me the option to save this afterwards, which I will do. It's going to be in a separate playlist um, entitled streams, series, or whatever. And yeah, cheers on nine. It's, it was it's good of you to join, man. I was happy to see you. Um, so, so thanks everybody for coming on. Um, it was really cool to have you guys. Uh, this is the first I've ever done a live stream in KSP or in, in any other context. So um, it means a lot to me to have you guys show up and be a part of it. And um, I'm, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope it was a, some lessons learned and I hope it'll improve your gaming experience as well. Um, and you know, don't hesitate to, to send me some questions or ask me, email me on Reddit or on Twitter as well. You can find me there. I, I've always got that end screen inf infographics where you can have my how to reach me on, on those two platforms as well. Um, I love I love interacting with people. I love answering questions. I'm on Discord as well. Not all the time, but, but often enough. And uh, if you have further stream ideas at some point... Um, let me know. I mean, I'm super open to doing this kind of stuff. I might, I've never done like a build starting from scratch and then, you know, showing you guys this process. This was this, you know, this, this build already existed. This was already like a mature build. This is a lot of hours getting into this kind of stuff to do. Um, <clears throat> but for a, maybe a bit of a slightly less finicky or complex build i could definitely do a live stream for that as well I, I wouldn't mind i've already got an idea and i can kind of maybe let you guys in on on what's next but um so right now like my my main go-to launch vehicle is the atlas baker and the baker upper stage is a fictional stage but i've had the idea on the back of my mind of maybe building an upper stage using the xlr 99 engine which is in here somewhere. 
Where is it? Why can't I find it? Anyways, uh, the XLR99, this guy, was the engine used on the X15. Um, and it's got some interesting capabilities, the fact that you can throttle it, that it's got six, six ignitions. And at 276 seconds of specific impulse in vacuum, it's not bad. It's no RL10, like it's not a Hydrolox engines, and it's there's some there are some um, hypergolic engines like the um, see, even the AJ10 mid is 278, but you've got a stupid long runtime on this guy of 2700 seconds, right? So this guy runs for so long, you can really start to do some interesting stuff, and your starting reliabilities are pretty good. Like if you compare that to to the AJ10, you've got like about a good 3% difference. Um, it is better, better than early Agena, yeah. So so I'm definitely thinking of building an upper stage that would replace the Baker upper stage and give us more capabilities um, and even, even um, reproducing uh, potentially a third stage that we could use for interplanetary transfers or whatever that would use the Juno, Juno 46K because again, it's got some it's got three ignitions and not just the one, and it does outperform the Agena ever so slightly. Um, it's got a long, a nice long rated burn time, so that's great. So, anyways, thanks everybody for for joining in. Um, it was great to have this Friday afternoon or morning or whatever um, with you guys. I really have a long time. Um, so yeah, thanks for being a part of the stream. Um, and thanks also for watching the series. Thanks for the comments and the likes that you guys put on there. It's super encouraging to have that. Um, I know that a lot of, of streamers or, or content creators always like annoy people to, to like and subscribe, but it, it it's, it's a really nice um, and encouraging thing when you see your channel kind of growing like that. It, it's very encouraging to keep going. So so don't hesitate to do that when you watch the channel. I'm not obli uh, you know, obligating you by any chance. If you don't feel like it, don't do it. It's, it's quite all right. I just want you guys to watch and, and to have fun. Like my, I do it because it makes people's days a little brighter when they get to watch some good KSP content, in my opinion. So that's really my big motivation in, in doing the series. And I know like N9's got a good channel as well. Carnassa's got some good stuff. Um, Felix Yu's got some, you know, he's got that new channel going um, on his side as well so there's there's a there's some nice ksp content that's that's happening now so it's 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 good it's fun to see um so yeah i ripped to the three people who just joined <laughs> i suppose um yeah i mean we're, we're on two hours and, and 20 minutes and i still haven't had uh supper yet and my voice is starting to get a little raspy so um We'll end it here. Um, I will do everything I can to make sure YouTube keeps this recording and then I will put it in a separate folder entitled live stream series so that you guys can come back to this at any point. And if you've just joined, um, fear not, it will be made available to you guys as well. So with that, have yourselves a great weekend and uh, we'll see you on the next flight.